All right, so Ecclesiastes for Beginners, this is lesson two in that series. Uh, we're going to uh, cover chapter two, beginning verse one, and the title of this lesson is The Pursuit of Pleasure. So uh, in the journal detailing his uh, life experience, Solomon records the conclusions of a lifetime search for happiness and satisfaction apart from God. That's the premise of this book that we talked about last week. And we said that his journal is divided into three main sections. First of all, there's the introduction, introductory part where he, he actually gives you know, his conclusions uh, at the very beginning of his journal. Uh, and then there's the exploration where he, you know, he kind of doubles back and he begins to explain how he arrived at these uh, conclusions. And then a summary, uh, chapter six, verse 10 to chapter 12, verse 14, where he gives his final conclusions, final thoughts on the experiences of his, of his life. Now we've noted that in the introduction he declares that the examined life, the examined life, because if the life is not examined, you know, one can go through life, you know, eat, drink, and be merry, oblivious to the truth, oblivious to anything. And many people, you know, that's how they live. They just go right through life. They're not thinking about anything greater, nothing above, nothing below, just this, this life. And Solomon is saying that um, the examined life, if you actually think about what life is about, he says that life will be found to be meaningless if lived without faith and obedience to God. This is largely the content of the introductory part of Ecclesiastes. Now the exploratory section describes the, you know, the various things that Solomon did in his search that eventually led to that particular conclusion, you know, that all is vanity. So in chapters two to six, he describes four key pursuits that he examined. Uh, the pursuit of pleasure, the pursuit of wisdom and folly, the pursuit of meaningful work, the pursuit of power and wealth. So those, that's the body of, the, uh, of this uh, particular book, his description of what he has learned while pursuing this, these various things. So today we're going to examine the first of these and that is the pursuit of pleasure. So here's Solomon, you know, he's got a, a kind of a life plan in front of him. He has wisdom beyond measure. He is rich. Uh, the nation is at peace. There's no wars or anything like that. So he's free to examine his life. And so he begins his search where most of us probably would. And that is the exploration of sensory pleasures. Uh, in other words, what could make him feel good? Now remember, he had imagination, he had time, he had money, he had influence, so he could try whatever he liked. Nothing was out of his reach. So in chapter two, beginning verse one, he writes, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure. So Solomon reviews his kind of self-talk at the beginning of his journey where his, you know, he kind of rubs his hands together at the sheer anticipation of the delights that he's about to help himself to. Wow, we're going to try everything. In verse 1b he says, so enjoy yourself and behold, it too was futility. So as in the previous section, he gives us the conclusion before describing his experience. And the conclusion was that sensuality was futile, empty, there was no lasting satisfaction. So he goes on to describe several areas where he kind of gave full vent to all of his desires. And so we begin with uh, laughter. He talks about laughter. He says, I said of laughter, it is madness, and of pleasure, what does it accomplish? So fun and games, right? Fun and games through a steady stream of entertainers and materials that were meant to amuse, comedians, clowns, plays, all of the things that would keep one laughing, humor. And Solomon, you know, he doesn't depreciate the importance of a healthy sense of humor, but rather that amusement in whatever measure does not bring lasting 
satisfaction. His point is laughter, you know, when you're laughing, it's like you're insane for a moment, just for a moment, right? I mean, if there's a joke and we laugh, it feels good. We kind of lose control. You ever have that, you know, that experience where something goofy happens and all of a sudden you get the giggles and you just can't stop laughing and the, 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 you watch somebody else laugh and they're laughing even harder and then you, you think about it and then you start to tear up. And you know what? You can never explain what is so funny to somebody else. You try the next day and say, wow, this happened and, and the person's looking at you going, huh? You know? So he's saying you know, that kind of laughter you know, where you're you know, gut busting, you're like insane for a moment. Well, yeah, sure, you kind of lose control. But the net result is whatever measure you have, it doesn't last. There's no great satisfaction that comes from it. Then he tries the consumption of wine. You know, remember, he's, he's on a journey now and he's, he's testing pleasure, all kinds of pleasures. So the pleasure that comes from wine. Uh, he, in other words, he's examining a mind-altering substance without becoming addicted. Now, Solomon didn't become a drunk, right? He says, my mind guiding me wisely. Listen, he says, I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine while my mind was guiding me wisely and how to take hold of folly until I could see what good there is for the sons of men to do under heaven the few years of their lives. As I say, he didn't become a drunk. He was you know, consuming, consuming to see what, what is that experience like? And so he becomes a connoisseur of fine wine, developing his appreciation of the substance to its maximum pleasure without becoming addicted, something that very few people can actually do. Yet even this, he says, did not provide for him the satisfaction that he desired. So he tries building projects. He says, I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself and I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself from which to irrigate a forest of growing, um, of growing trees. So he enters into kind of a vigorous public works project. We all know how satisfying it is to build something from a birdhouse to a barn, right? We always feel good, ah, job well done. You know, every, every new project requires a new tool, right? So <laughs> all kinds of pleasures in building things. And so he, he builds things, houses, plants, parks, pools, fountains, and yet no comment about whether this was satisfactory or not. And then the next thing he tries sensuality for its own sake. And he says, I bought male and female slaves and I had home born slaves. Also I possessed flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. Also I collected for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasures of men, many concubines. So he lists all the things he collected, slaves, animals, singers, wives, concubines. You know, in 1 Kings 11.3 it says that he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. So here's a man who had inexhaustible, erotic, sensual experiences at his disposal. Entertainment, service, sexual variety beyond measure. Footnote here in 1 Kings 11, 3b also tells us that it was his abundance of foreign wives who led him ultimately into idolatry. It wasn't the, the sexuality that turned Solomon's heart away from God, it was the leading into idolatry by these foreign wives. So Solomon was unfaithful, not because he had many wives, but rather because his wives and concubines were, many of them were pagan. So even with all of this sensual delight, he ultimately declares that they left him bored. Imagine, you have a thousand wives and his ultimate statement, they left him bored and frustrated. Then he talks about pursuing just the good life, the good life. He says, then I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stood by me. All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. 
I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart was pleased because of all my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. So Solomon gives a, an image of himself as seen by others as one living the good life, wealthy, denying himself nothing. Now there was a reward for this kind of life of pleasure. We're not saying, oh, it wasn't any fun, it wasn't any good. He says there's a reward. In other words, he got something out of it. It's not that he didn't feel anything. Out of laughter, what did he get? Well, the joy and relief that comes with laughter. Out of the consumption of wine, well, the taste and the feeling that it gives. Out of the building projects, well, the sense of pride and achievement that those things give you. Out of eroticism, well, the pleasure that the body feels when stimulated by music or sex or personal attentive service, yes. And out of prosperity, well, the satisfaction and assurance that comes with success. So it's not that he didn't get anything out of it, of course, he got out of it what those things give. But these pleasures are inherently human and neither moral or immoral. They're neither good nor bad. I mean, feeling a feeling related to humor or work or sex is neutral. It's a pleasurable feeling. In verses nine and 10, Solomon said that he experienced all of these feelings in their proper context and in great abundance. No sin there, no sin there. In verse 11, he says, thus I considered all my activities which my hands had done and the labor which I had exerted. And behold, all was vanity and striving after wind and there was no profit under the sun. So in verse 11, he gives his verdict on what experiencing all of these great pleasures has taught him. And the lesson is not that pleasure is bad. That's not the lesson he learned. His conclusion is that although the feelings were real and the pleasures were enjoyable and authentic, they did not linger and thus did not accumulate in order to produce something greater and something lasting. You know, the question is, how satisfying today is yesterday's supper? No matter how good it was. How good today is yesterday's movie that you enjoyed? Or sexual experience that you enjoyed? You know, we have a memory of these things happening and even a memory of the pleasure, but the pleasure itself is gone. And so sensual pleasures cannot be accumulated or stored. They're fleeting, they're transitory. And so you know, we need to see the difference between legitimate pleasure and illicit pleasure. Legitimate pleasure is momentary and it leaves you only wanting more. Illicit pleasure is also momentary, but it leaves you feeling guilty and ashamed. There's the difference. Solomon concludes that the pursuit of pleasure, even legitimate pleasure, is vanity because there's no gain in his present and you know, level of satisfaction. He is as dissatisfied at the end of his search as he was at the beginning, because he can't store it up, you can't pack it up, you can't take all these pleasures and pack them up and, and create something else with them. They just, they kind of just go through you. So the seeking after sensual pleasure is the common man's treadmill. It is the factor that keeps most people working too hard, living too fast, and dying too young. Our society is geared to providing for ourselves whatever feels good as a substitute for providing for ourselves that which is good. There's a difference between what feels good and what is good. You know, we live and die in the rat race to obtain that which will satisfy us and we try to achieve this by pursuing things that only make us feel good but can't really fulfill our basic needs. So we, we chase after security and cars and clothes and homes and education, sex, 
status, power, entertainment, independent, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Sometimes we delude ourselves into thinking that this striving for pleasure is really a kind of a spiritual thing because we, we run the race with other Christians. You know, we trade with each other, we display our status or clothes or wealth in front of each other, we entertain each other and call it the brotherhood rat race. The race that we ought to be in, however, is the race for the crown of life. No rats in that race. This race strives for that which is good, not that which promises to feel good. Therein lies the difference between spirituality and sensuality. And so Solomon learned that sensuality was a dead end for several reasons. First of all, the pursuit of pleasure promises much, but it delivers little. Whatever promise sensual pleasures make, they either are not as good as they promise or they only last for a short time. And that's as good as it gets. And if they are illicit, no matter how powerfully pleasurable they are, they always bring shame and guilt and craving afterwards. Secondly, the pursuit of pleasure promises to improve our lives, but in reality our lives are rarely changed or improved by merely sensual pleasures. I mean, no matter how much I enjoy a concert, my life is rarely changed simply by the sensual pleasure that I gain from listening to a particular artist. Again, if it's illicit, then it makes my life even worse. Thirdly, pursuit of pleasures promise to satisfy our needs, but in the end, our needs continue to place a demand on us, or we often become disillusioned, feeling our needs will never be met. That's the, that's the treadmill. <laughs> that's the treadmill. If our pleasures are sinful, then our needs become insatiable cravings. Now, you know, don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying that pleasure is wrong, it's not. I mean, if we can have pleasure, it's because God created us in such a way that we're, you know, we're able to feel these things. So, the, so pleasure all by itself is not wrong. I'm saying that legitimate pleasure is not the avenue to pursue or to find meaning and fulfillment and satisfaction in life. And illicit pleasure is dangerous in that it destroys our ability to enjoy normal human pleasure and, la and, 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 and casts us headlong into self-destruction. You know, what's the thing about drugs? Well, it stimulates the pleasure part of the brain. You know, we have a part of the brain that kind of feels pleasure, that, you know, that, 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 that controls the feeling of pleasure, that releases the chemicals that you know, we, we say, oh, that felt good. You know, what do drugs do? Drugs go into that part of the brain and overstimulate it. Too much pleasure, a huge rush that goes through our body. And people say, oh man, I, whew, I saw the stars. It was great, whoa, what a feeling. Yeah, yeah, what, what did we just do? We broke the barrier that God placed for pleasure. Pleasure is legitimate pleasure, has its place, but there's a barrier there. And when we go beyond that barrier, then the feeling of pleasure becomes a craving. And our whole life then becomes focused on repeating that fantastic rush of pleasure we had at the very beginning. And I mean, I'm telling you things that you know. You know we, we know about drugs and things like that. We know that you know, once you go past that barrier, you want to go back again. But then it becomes you know, a law of diminishing return. You try to go back and get that initial rush and it doesn't happen and eventually you're just taking the drugs you know, to stop the pain. But it's the, same for, it's, it's the same for all addictive things, pornography. You know, this tremendous sexual rush that happens. I've read material that says that pornography is more addictive than cocaine. 
because it releases such a, such a rush through the system of sexual pleasure. Yeah, sure, at the beginning. What has happened? We've broken the line. We've gone past the line, the barrier that God puts for us to enjoy pleasure legitimately, where it actually edifies us, where it's actually good and we feel good and it's good all in itself and we can thank God for it and praise God. You know, in, in, in marriage classes and you know, those type of classes that I've done, I said, you know, it's great to say to God, please God, let my wife and I have wonderful sex and thank you God, we had wonderful, you know. But if you're consuming child pornography, you can't say, oh God, thank you for this. See what I'm saying? So we have to watch out with, with pleasure. God created us with the ability to enjoy pleasures of every kind. But this is not where we find the key to wholeness of being or peace or deep satisfaction of the soul that everyone needs to feel truly good. So what is needed is to find those things which are themselves innately good and consume these things. This is where real satisfaction comes that remains with you, that is accumulated throughout a lifetime. The things to look for are those which deliver what they promise and make us you know, better people and satisfy our most basic needs. You know, Solomon summarized some of them at the end of his book. For example, faith and obedience in God. These things deliver great gifts and they are a constant daily source of joy, growing and affecting every part of our being. You know, the fact that I obeyed God yesterday in some situation, the satisfaction that I feel from that time of closeness to God because I was doing things or something that was according to His will, that continues to bless me even today and in the future. What do you think Jesus is talking about when He says to the woman at the well, you know, the water I'm going to give you, you'll never be thirsty again. You know, it'll, it'll create a, a, a fount, a life, a spring of life inside of you, living water. That's what he's talking about. That satisfaction that, that, is, that, isn't, that doesn't come from taking something from the outside and consuming it, but rather that is inside of you and, and, and works its way out of you as peace and satisfaction. To others, like the first, the knowledge of Christ and a relationship with Him. A relationship, imagine, a relationship where we can communicate with Almighty God at any time, any place. And of course, submission to the Holy Spirit. Whoever thought that submission, the word submission would be related to pleasure? We're always thinking submission. Oh dear, I'm going to have to submit. Oh, that's going to be hard. I'm going to hate that. That's going to make me feel bad. Well, no. Try it. Pray for that. Instead of asking for stuff, you know, I want to feel better. I want more of this. You know, make sure my, my raise is big. You know, instead of asking for stuff, ask God if He would help you to be more in submission to the Holy Spirit. Ask Him that prayer and see the reward that comes with the answer to that prayer. To be in submission to God's Spirit. To know that what we are doing and saying and the way that we are living and thinking and praying is pleasing to God, that in itself provides this peace that goes beyond understanding, this pleasure that goes beyond physical pleasure. 
You know, when Jesus said, you know, I have food to eat, the apostles came back and said, hey, you, know, well, you, you need to eat. And he says, I have food to eat that you don't even know about. What was the food that gave him satisfaction? He was doing the will of the Father with this woman. He was acknowledging that he was the Messiah to this woman. He was saving the soul of this woman. When we're doing God's will in His service, no matter what it is, we're eating that food that, yeah, that other people don't know about, that brings great satisfaction. You know, God created us with the ability to enjoy the pleasures of every kind, as I said, but it isn't the place where we find wholeness of being or peace. So faith, Obedience to God, knowledge of Christ, submission to the Holy Spirit. These things are not like the things that Solomon talks about, the things that he pursued to find pleasure. The race for pleasure in earthly things ends in disappointment and disillusionment, dissatisfaction, if it is pursued as an avenue for satisfaction, enlightenment and joy. That's the, you know, if you're wondering, what was the point of the lesson that we had this morning? Well, this is the point of the lesson. Pleasure is not wrong in itself. God has created us as beings to be able to experience pleasure. But pleasure is not the thing that gives us that wholeness. My son describes it in a different way. He says, well, he says, we have a round hole inside of us that needs to be filled. And the problem is we take square things or triangular things and we try to jam them into that hole to fill it. The square things and the triangular things, those are pleasure and worldly things and accumulation and all that kind, all that, just, they, they don't fill the hole. The round peg that fills the round hole is God, is Jesus, is the Spirit of God, is God's word. Those are the round things that fit into the round hole that cry out for satisfaction, for peace. Only faith and obedience in God and a relationship with Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit can truly satisfy the deep yearnings of man. Why? Well, because sensual pleasure only goes skin deep. Sensual pleasure was created for the flesh. The yearnings, however, that come from man's soul, these things, only spiritual things, can satisfy these kinds of, these kinds of yearning. And also, I'll tell you another thing, pleasure is for rejoicing and thanksgiving, rather than hoarding or abusing. Like I said, you feel something pleasurable, you eat some, a good meal, for example, Give thanks to God. You know, sometimes I think we ought to give thanks after we eat. <laughs> would make more sense, wouldn't it? Thank you, God, that was delicious. That's what, that's what sensual pleasure is for. It's to provoke us to give thanks to Him. What a beautiful day, the sun, oh, a perfect day, I'm out in the boat, I'm fishing, oh man, it's so wonderful. What do I do with all of this just wonderful stuff? I say thank you. I don't quit my job and you know, try to be a fish. Isn't there a song out there? If I could fish all day or something, it'd be wonderful. I say thank you. A good thing happens to me. I say thank you. I praise God. I share it with others. That's what sensual pleasure is for. It provokes us to give thanks. It provokes us to share. But sensual pleasure is not there to take the place of spiritual things. And this is what Solomon learns in the end. Unfortunately, we, we can't do the entire book in one shot. You know, it would be, oh yeah, okay, it makes sense. We have to break it up into pieces because we teach this one class at a time. But this is the direction he's going. So he's explored these areas and he's finding this out here. So we're going to stop here. 
uh, with this class and we're going to continue next time as Solomon continues in his search for satisfaction uh, in things under the sun. All right, thank you very much for your attention.